Good morning. Happy Easter. Can you stand with me? I'm going to pray for us. Father God, we come to you this morning, and it is only by you, Jesus, that we can stand, that we can praise, that we can lift our voice. So God, be glorified in this praise. Be glorified in this moment, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Sing this out. Oh, I'll praise in the valley and I'll praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm short. I'll praise when I'm down. Oh, and I'll praise when I'm numbered and I'll praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the water. We sing this out. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise the Lord, oh my soul. I'm going to praise the Lord, oh my soul. Sing, I'll praise when I feel it. I'll praise when I feel it. I'll praise when I don't. I praise cause I know that you're still in control Oh my praise because my praise is a weapon It's more than a sound Oh my praise is the shout that brings Jericho down As long as I'm, as long as I'm breathing I've got a reason to Clap our hands this morning. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Sing this out. I praise cause you're sorry. I praise cause you reign. I praise cause you rose in defeat in the grave. I praise cause you're faithful, I praise cause you're true, I praise cause there's nobody greater than you, and I praise cause you're sovereign, I praise cause you reign, I praise cause you rose and defeated the grave, and I praise cause you're faithful, I praise cause you're true, I praise cause there's nobody greater than you. We worship. 
We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who never more He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. This morning we sing to God. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. He hung up on that cross. And he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. This morning, this is who we are. We were the best. Thank you. 
sing him. You are here, you're moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, you're working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, Lord. you are here. Moving in our midst, I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you, Jesus. I worship. Let's declare who we are. Cause you are waiting, miracle work, promise keep. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way make miracle work, promise keep. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, you're turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, Lord, healing every heart. I worship you, and I worship. Cause you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. You are way maker, 
Pray with me. Father, we just acknowledge this morning that um, nothing we could do, no efforts, no amount of good deeds, Lord, no amount of making ourselves look good on the inside and outside will ever be enough to fix what's broken inside of us, to make right what was wrong. And it is only by Jesus this morning we can stand before you, Father, and give you this praise, and give you the glory you deserve. So God, this morning we look to your faithfulness and we acknowledge God in the moments that we forget that you would remind us of your faithfulness over the years. Remind us of that provision you made Remind us, God, of that word that was spoken over our life. Remind us, God, of that time when you came and comforted us. That even when we didn't see your goodness, that you were working in the midst of it. We love you, Lord. Thank you for working. Thank you for moving. And more importantly, thank you for your righteousness that we can put on as clothes this morning and wear. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Can we all say this together? Amen. Amen. Why don't you just uh, take a moment, and can you really, can you welcome someone to church, like an Easter welcome? I'm not talking the piddly stuff, like, like, come on. We're all in church. It's Easter. Go ahead. Those of you that are uh, viewing us by live stream, we are packed out, set up here. For those of you in the atrium, this is 20 foot tall. Randy saying hi. Okay. Um, not sure why you want to be out there, but hey. A um, couple of quick announcements. One is some of you may have noticed coming in if you came in the main entrance that the inner door of the airlock there on the one side here, um, we had an interesting thing happen on Monday night. Uh, I don't know if it was a thunder or a car going by, but spontaneously, the windows just shattered on that one door. Uh, so it'll be repaired hopefully in the next day or two. Um, I will confess I was uncomfortable with so many people coming in and seeing it that way, so I had our artists originally put some cardboard on either side and on coming in, um, paint a very realistic picture of the atrium, like you were just walking in, and then going out like it was the parking lot. And we had a few people, though, bumping heads over that, and... Uh, we had several people step into the picture and disappear. Um, so we just put up what we got now. Anyways, a few quick thoughts for you. We have uh, Detroit Bob Institute uh, is starting up on uh, this Tuesday, the classes. Our men's event, The Garage, our men's ministry, uh, is having an event this Saturday for the final four men. Um, not final four men, just final four men. All right, And then the Oasis Retreat for our women is coming up in a week or two as well, too, if you want to be a part of that. And then one final thing is that we've been involved in the Osborne community, one of the, uh, uh, what had been at one time the most violent uh, zip code in the nation, no longer is it that. 
And we've started actually the robotics program there. And they've been competing and did extremely well the other day. They, they managed to get into the semis. And so just for those that were part of this, that helped out and have been managing this, our thanks to all who were part of that. They've done a really great job with that. Um, at this point in time, we receive our offering usually. Now, if you are uh, someone who's exploring the things of God, we do not expect you to participate in the offering. There's more important issues for you to be focused on right now, to be honest, like your future reality, okay, and salvation, history, all that. Um, if you have a home church elsewhere, uh, again, we assume you support that home church. Um, so don't feel any pressure on that. In fact, you should never be in a place where there's uh, pressure or manipulation or compulsion of any time. That's just not really in alignment. There's a lot the scripture says about money, about what it says about us, our priorities, our commitments, our allegiances, a lot. Um, and sometimes we talk about that, but today's that, that's not the conversation. Some of us give online, some of us in the service give in the service. Um, but if you're in that first two categories, again, just let it pass you on by, all right? Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning and we sing your praises, but we also understand what our bank account says of our priorities and guidelines. And so, Lord, this morning, we give you just a fraction, literally, of what you've given us. We give it to you because freely you have given to us, and so now we freely give back. We give to you because everything we have comes from you, and we want to acknowledge that. We want to give gratitude and thanks, but also to recognize your lordship in our lives. And then we also give, Lord, so that others may hear and be blessed, or others may receive blessing and encouragement and assistance. So Lord, for all these reasons, we lay this at your feet today. We pray that these things would be used with wisdom and integrity for your purposes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of the shadows, bound for the gallows, a dead man walking, till love came calling, rise up.
Yeah, I'm ready to go home. <laughs> um, would you stand, please, for the reading of the Word of God? Reading in Matthew chapter 28. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and he sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen. Just as he said, Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He's risen from the dead. Father, I pray your anointing upon our time here and upon your word, Lord. Open our hearts and minds to receive, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Her story weighs back of a guy who was coming home late from a gathering and he decides to take a shortcut so he goes through a cemetery. A little weird, but late at night, but figures nobody's watching. Well, he doesn't realize that there had been some preparation for a grave the day before that they were going to use later and without realizing it, he, he falls into this grave. And he tries to get out, you know, climbing, doing everything, scratching around, and just realizes he's not going to get out of this grave. He's going to have to wait till morning. Someone will come and, and find him, he's sure. So he settles down into a far end of the grave and quietly decides to wait out the night. Only to be interrupted an hour or two later by someone who had the same idea, only this guy's somewhat inebriated. He's, he's drunk, coming home from a gathering, and he's just wandering around, and, and, and as he's wandering past, he falls into the same grave on the other end. And his immediate thing, once he gets his surrounding, is to, to try to, to scrabble his way out as well, too. And, and it's not working, and as he settles for a moment against the wall of the grave, he hears this quiet voice from the other end in the darkness saying, there's no use trying, you'll never get out. <laughs> but he did. <laughs> Talking about graves is scary stuff sometimes. But today we're not talking about something scary, we're actually going to be talking about something pretty um, unique, pretty unusual, and pretty amazing. We mentioned recently, if you weren't here, um, about the crucifixion last week and, and how, you know, when you ha talk about the assassination, um, nobody's sure what that is. Is it the assassination of, of uh, JFK? Is it the assassination of someone else? Or the poisoning of, Marie, of, of somebody? Is it... Is, is it you know, what are you talking about? But when you say the crucifixion, even in a secularized society, everyone knows you're talking about. Why is it that one time when this method of death was used out of the hundreds of thousands and not millions, this one stands out and everyone knows it? What's even more unique, though, is when you mention the word resurrection, everybody knows what that's about even more so. Even secularists, even non-believers know what's being referenced in that say, statement. And the more unusual because unlike the crucifixion where others were crucified, but that one crucifixion stands out in such a way as to be called the crucifixion, nobody has ever been resurrected before. Not by their own power and their own ability. And so when you reference the resurrection, you're referencing something that stands out above anything else in recorded history. We can bring questions about that, and one of the things that, that's really critical about the, the resurrection is to whether it is real or not. If it's not real, then we don't have to worry about it, but if it is, the implications are massive. There's a guy named J. Warner Wallace, and maybe I've heard him before, but I'm not familiar with him until just recently, and I've stumbled across him. Evidently, he's a police and media sensation that's known for solving homicides when the trail has gone cold. It could be decades after the crime has been committed. There's little or no forensic evidence, and there might be no surviving witnesses at all. He is the ultimate cold case investigator. And so he seeks out secondary witnesses who can be evaluated in a number of ways to um, confirm their reliability, says Wallace. Using the methods that he's had, and by taking this approach, he says, quote, I have arrested and successfully prosecuted a number of cold case suspects who thought they had gotten away with murder. This guy's received national 
recognition. He's featured as a cold case detective on NBC's Dateline, Fox 11, LA News, um, Court TV, True TV. He's been the award, the Sustained Superiority Award, a Fire and Police Award. Evidently, he actually got an award in 2015 for the best solved cold case. I didn't know they gave an award for that. But the best solved cold case. And so this guy, this is what he does. Looks into things that, that have been, no other detective can go because it's so long past and, and, and not, the, the things are difficult to get a hold of. He wrote a book, evidently, called Cold Case Christianity, A Homicide Detective Investigates the Claims of the Gospel. Wallace writes this, he says, my friends knew me as an angry atheist. This is not a believer. He is now. But at the time of his investigation and at the height of his career, he said they knew me as an angry atheist, a skeptic who thoughtfully dissected Christians and the Christian worldview. He writes that he was 35 years old when the Gospels caught his attention as an investigator who had interviewed thousands of witnesses and suspects. As an atheist, Wallace became intrigued with the Gospels and their account of Jesus' resurrection because, as he puts it, quote, the most important question I could ask about Christianity just happened to fall within my area of expertise. Did Jesus really rise from the dead? It was the ultimate cold case forensic investigation because eyewitnesses the material evidence that could be used to prove or disprove what had been happened had been gone for nearly 2,000 years. Wallace, a skeptic, an atheist, came away after his investigation absolutely convinced it was true. He says, as an atheist, that he'd always assumed that the resurrection was a lie, believing that the 12 apostles concocted, executed, and maintained the most elaborate and influential conspiracy of all time. But when Wallace looked at the evidence, and as an unbeliever, he found four minimal facts to be substantiated by both friends and foes of Christianity. First, Jesus died on the cross and was buried. Everyone, foes and, and those in favor alike, said that was the case. Two, Jesus' tomb was empty and no one ever produced the body. Both sides would agree with that. Three, Jesus' disciples believed that they saw Jesus resurrected from the dead. Everyone agrees on that. Four, Jesus' disciples were transformed following their alleged resurrection observations. Jesus, Wallace then goes on to tell how using the reasoning he would use, the same methods he would use to solve a crime scene, and inferring the most reasonable explanation, came up with several hypotheses. You want to hear those hypotheses? Well, if you do, I'm going to read them to you. <laughs> if you don't, I'm going to read them to you. Okay. One, the disciples were mistaken about Jesus' death. Jesus survived his crucifixion and appeared to disciples after he recovered. But Wallace says this theory fails to explain what the disciples saw when they brought Jesus down from the cross. Didn't they check if he was breathing, if his body was cold, or if rigor mortis had set in? Is it reasonable to believe that they would have not noticed any of these com conditions common to a dead body? In addition to this, it should be noted that the Romans were were experts at not only execution, but this particular that they had perfected to an art. They knew what they were doing. In addition to a lance that was slashed into the side, where blood and water, indicating a broken heart and death had occurred, pours out. Two, he said the disciples stole the body and fabricated the story of the resurrection. And while this explanation accounts for the empty tomb, it fails to account for the transformed lives of the apostles. The apostles, who had been incredible cowards up to that point in time, were now suddenly as bold as a battleship because of the lies they themselves had concocted. We're going to have a little fun with that next week if you come here on that particular one. And when we do, one thing to remember is that every one of these guys died rather than betray the faith. The only one who, who lived out his life, but it was in exile, and don't forget this name, was John. John lives his life out, but in total exile. He's the only one of the disciples not to be murdered for the faith. Three, Wall says the disciples were delusional. This fails to account for the empty tomb, though. More importantly, Wallace argues that he's never encountered large groups having identical hallucinations. Four, an imposter tricked the disciples, convincing them that Jesus was alive. 
But this theory fails to account for the empty tomb, and it requires an impersonator. The disciples would have been highly skeptical, and the impersonator would have had to have been adept at copying Jesus' mannerisms. Above all, he would have needed to possess miraculous powers since the disciples report Jesus working miracles after the resurrection. And then five. The resurrection is a wildly exaggerated legend that grew exponentially over time. But this theory, he says, this professional investigator says, clashes with the record of witnesses making claims about the resurrection from the earliest days of the Christian movement. Wallace concludes this, quote, the resurrection is reasonable. The answers are available. You don't have to turn off your brain to be a believer. And what's really significant is that Wallace is the last, uh, only most recent, of a long list of intellectuals and skeptics that have come to believe in the resurrection. Lee Strobel, who was a hard-fighting investigative journalist for the Chicago uh, Tribune, I believe it was, became a Christian and investing in there. There's, there's dozens, hundreds of others who, as they've really looked at this, have come to that conclusion that the resurrection is a paradigm-shattering event of historical impact. And here's the problem then for you and I. Because if that is true, what are the implications for us and for our lives? Because if it is true that Christ is who he said he was, and he was crucified for our sins, but also rose from the dead and is alive today, then the implications for us and our own lives are massive. When we look into this passage of Scripture that talks about him being risen from the dead and this shaking of a moment, this is the proof of who he was. It's a powerful event, but, but it has to be tied into what his life's work was about and, and linked directly to the crucifixion. It's the, the, the statement of victory over death. It's the statement of, of who he was. It's the success of all of that. But if that's all you've understood, then you miss the depth of what this is about. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 17 through 20, Paul, someone who comes to follow Christ later in life, says, but if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you're still guilty, all of us, of our sins. In that case, all who've died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. If the resurrection isn't true, if Christ is not who he said he was and is, then this is all just the end. It's nothingness. But he goes on in verse 20 to make a statement that on its surface seems typical of a believer, but is massive when you understand it in the context of his life. But in fact, in verse 20 says, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who've died. Now, why is that a significance? Paul was not one of the original disciples. He's a, an educated Jewish man, an educated Roman citizen, one of high standing. He was so offended at, at what he saw with the Christians, the disciples, that he persecuted them. He sought them out and executed them. He was responsible for the death of Christians. And on the way to Damascus to carry out even more violence against the Christians because he was so insistent upon it, he has an encounter with Christ. Knocks him right off his donkey. He was riding a donkey at the time. Some people call it a jackass. Knocked him right off his donkey. And, and he, 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 has a, he, he sees who Christ is. And this hardened intellectual of Roman persuasion and Jewish depth that would never blasphemy against God, becomes convinced. And so he's the one that makes the statement, but in fact, Christ has raised from the dead. Every disciple, every single disciple, except for John, who's exiled, every single one dies. They don't make money off this deal. They don't get good press off this deal. They don't get cushy jobs off this deal. All of them die, holding to the truth of the resurrection. Paul, who had a great position, security for life, all the, he gave all that up. He also, he can't be crucified because he's a Roman citizen, but he's beheaded by Nero. 
Paul was the ultimate skeptic. But he becomes convinced. And notice this line. In fact, Christ is raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who've died. In other words, Jesus is just the first. Eventually, all who believe will have life eternal. Plato, at one point in the dialogues, in, in uh, um, one of his works, talks about a group of people who are in a cave and they're chained to a wall. And behind them, there's a fire. And items pass between them and the fire and they see the shadows on the wall and that's what they think reality is. That's all they can see of what reality is is by the shadows cast on the wall. But he says one day, one of them is set free and he exits the cave and comes into the sunlight and sees the reality of what is real. And he, he paints that as the philosopher who comes by reason to understand what we can only theorize and, and examine and have the shadow. C.S. Lewis referred to this as the shadow lands. And the scripture talks about, about the fact of, of where we're at now in light of the full reality of heaven. Let me get this across to you real quick. If you ever get the idea that heaven is a bunch of, of, of people sitting up there on white clouds and plinking on harps, I can accept that hell is people with accordions. That I can get. But, but, but heaven is not harps, okay? And people don't become angels or get their wings, you know, when those things happen. Angels are a whole other being and creatures. Heaven is the, is the reality, the deepest, most real, intense reality that it is. And what we face here is the shadows. And we face death in the land of the shadow of death. But in Plato's cave, one steps out and sees the reality. And he theorizes, what if he were to come back in and to try to draw the others out of the cave and tell them, no, this is what grass is like. This is the feeling of rain. This is what the, they would think him mad, they said. Isn't it ironic that in the midst of that, that there's a cave that Jesus is in? That in the resurrection, he comes out of that cave. That Paul says he's the first of a host that are going to come out of the shadow lands, that are going to come into the reality of heaven. They're going to see life for eternity. All of us have been chained in the same cave. And in the darkness of that cave, there are some deep horrors and sadness that can appear. But Christ came to draw us out of that. He came to give us a freedom to give us new life. That's why Easter has always been about hope and new life and resurrection. In Isaiah, the prophet, in the 53rd chapter, it talks about Messiah, a prophecies that were done um, hundreds of years before Jesus came. They talk about his clothing being, being uh, um, uh, gambled away at the foot of the cross. That there's so many other prophecies about it. This one in Isaiah 53, 9, it says he had done no wrong, had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. And we know from Scripture that's exactly what happened. That the grave, the cave that he came out of was actually a rich man at one time. It was his grave. The, the prophet Isaiah in the 53rd chapter earlier um, breaks even down more about Jesus. There's nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. Despised and rejected, man of sorrows. Verse 4 says, yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrow that weighed him down. We thought his troubles were punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. Verse 5 says, but he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away, have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the sins of us all. The scripture says that the wages of sin are death and also says that everyone has sinned. There is none righteous, no, not one, not Mother Teresa, not the most holy, righteous person you can imagine. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of that is death. But Christ, God provided Christ to pay the price for that. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, it says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. God comes, in other words, in the flesh, in the person of Christ. 
For God in all His fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through Him God reconciled everything to Himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. And Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 says, For it's by grace that you and I have been saved. Something we didn't merit, something that we don't deserve. It's by grace we've been saved through our faith, in Christ's work on the cross, through our repentance of our sin and acceptance of His grace. But it says, this is not from yourself. It's the gift of God. It's not by works so that no one could boast. Too often today, Christians are portrayed, sometimes wrongfully so, sometimes rightfully so, as arrogant, harsh, ugly, mean, Sometimes it's conveyed that way because we just stand for a position of truth that we see in Scripture. And sometimes we do it as thoughtfully and as gracefully and as lovingly as we can, but because it stands in opposition to a world that's gone dark, that hate comes. But other times it's because there's an attitude that comes into play, and that should never be a part of Christianity. Christians of all people should be the most humble, the kindest people that there are. Because we know that we stand, not because we're our own righteousness and not because we're so much. We stand broken in our sin and we stand only by the grace of God. There's one point in time when um, after the resurrection, Jesus is coming to his disciples and they're seeing him after the resurrection. And the disciples are amazed and their, their minds are blown and it, it changes them and change them from these cowardly guys to these lions of the faith. But Thomas is one of the disciples that, that he says, I'm not going to believe unless I can put my, my fingers right inside the wounds. I, I, this is not true. He's known as doubting Thomas or as the skeptic. It's really important to note, Jesus doesn't show up with Thomas and, and then just say, see, here's what's going on. Now you go to hell because you didn't believe. He actually answers the skeptic. We find in John chapter 20, verse 26, that even in earlier says, but eight days later the disciples were together. This time Thomas was with them, and the doors were locked, but suddenly as before, Jesus is standing amongst them. He comes through the locked door. Peace be with you, he said. And then he says to Thomas, you lousy skeptic, you horrible human being, you excuse of a person. None of that's there. He says, peace. And then he says, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand in the wound where the lance was in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. Thomas's response, my Lord and my God. Not just my rabbi, my master, my Lord, but my God. No good Jewish boy would ever blaspheme that way. He realized in that moment of time that the man he'd walked with for three years truly was the Son of God. Jesus tells them, you believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those of us who believe without seeing me. Second to last scripture I'm going to offer you real quickly here. We've read it before, but John chapter 1, verse 29. John the Baptist is hanging out with some of his disciples. Jesus comes walking by, and John sees him, and, and it says on John chapter 1, verse 29, so Jesus came to him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, they had sacrificed lambs forever in Israel. It was required, that the idea that those were, were the, the action of sin. And, and so you see the bloodiness of your sin. You, you see that lamb being killed and you realize I should be killed, but God's holding back and, and giving me grace because of the sacrifice. And now they realize, and what John's saying is Jesus is the lamb of God. He's the sacrifice that once and for all wipes out the need for any more sacrifices. All the sacrifices, all the, the millions of lambs slaughtered before, all those actions of, of, of ritual and everything, all pointed to this moment of time of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And the proof of it is the resurrection. This is the Lamb of God, slain in the sins of the world. But there's something a little deeper here. You see, the Jews... Um, once a year would have what was called the Day of Atonement. 
And on this Day of Atonement, again, it happened year after year. And so when you're doing sacrifices year after year, you just would, man, when is this going to end? Do we have to keep facing the bloodiness of our sin all the time? When will this end? You look forward to the idea of this sometimes stopping its function. On the Day of Atonement, there was something special that kind of happened, um, especially in the days of Israel when they were out in the desert. But even afterwards, it was still carried out in the temple time period. How many of you ever heard of the term scapegoat? If you haven't, then that's probably because you were made one at one point in time and nobody told you, okay? <laughs> the term scapegoat is um, a, a, a popular phrase. You know, someone does something wrong, but they're lower on the totem pole um, than the guy who actually did it. And so we, we, we say, you're at fault and not the boss. Um, politicians, uh, the military, whatever the case is, uh, you know, I, I, I like the way you handle responsibility. I'm going to blame more things on you, okay? <laughs> and so scapegoat is the one that basically pays the price for another's sin and failure and shortcoming. What I don't know if you knew is that that is not a, 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 a current creation. The term scapegoat is a biblical term. It goes way back to the Days of Atonement Way back even when Israel was in the desert, running around with the tabernacle at that time. See, what would happen in those days, and you can read about it in Leviticus chapter 16 sometime. Basically, um, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest Aaron would, would gather two goats. One goat would be, would be sacrificed for the sins of the people. The other goat would be referred to as a scapegoat. And it says in this point, Simon says that Aaron would lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel, all their transgressions, all their sins, putting on them on the head of the goat. And so he'd load up all the sins of the people. He'd pronounce them. Can you imagine? So uh, lying, cheating, adultery, killing. He'd lay all this on the head of this goat. And then they would have someone, usually a Gentile who was not associated with the tribe, would take that goat off into the desert to be... Uh, killed by wild animals or at least carried away never to be seen because the last thing you want to do is wake up in the morning and find that goat in your front yard <laughs> loaded with all the sins of the people, okay? That was one loaded goat, all right? And so that was the term scapegoat. You see, the Eastern mind works in the way of pictures. We do things by factual stuff in the West. This is why Jesus spoke in parables. And this picture was to point to Christ, it was to give a vivid illustration of something that is loaded up that pays the price for the sins of the people. That was the term. One of the interesting sub-things that would come from this is that some of the um, other writings outside of Scripture in Jewish tradition said there was a certain tradition surrounding the goat and a red cord. You only find it in a few sources. But it was said that they would take a red cord red being symbolic of blood, judgment, and punishment, and that the high priest would place it upon the head of the goat, the scapegoat, as he's pouring out all the sins of the people and pronouncing them over him, that the red cord basically is symbolic of your sin and of mine. And then as that goat is carried off and taken off into the wilderness to die the penalty for all our sins, there's an interesting other tradition that we find in what's called the Mishnah, it's an extra-biblical source recorded by Jewish people, not Christian believers, that said the red cord then would be taken, and according to that tradition, it was um, placed or hung in front of the altar, later in the temple area, the doorway even going into the temple. And the legend would have is that over the next year, the cord would miraculously, uh, mysteriously change from red to white. Witnesses interpreted that to mean that, that God's supernatural ability to forgive their sins and that had been washed clean. Another interesting note, according to those, some of those same Jewish sources, again, not Christian sources, about 40 years before the end of the temple and the destruction of 70 A.D. by the Romans, of which only the western retaining wall is left right now, the Wailing Wall or Western Wall, about 40 years prior to, the cord ceased to change color. That would put it around 30. That would put it around the death of Christ. In other words, the sense was that the system was no longer working. In other words, there was no longer need for sacrifice, that somehow that scapegoat, that one item, 
that somehow resolve things. Who is Jesus? That question, that comment could go on for a very, very long time. But who is Jesus? He's the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end of all time and space and reality. Who is Jesus? He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the final sacrifice for your sins and mine. Who is Jesus? He is our scapegoat. We're the guilty ones. We're the ones who have done the crimes. But he takes the punishment. He takes the blame. Who is Jesus? He's victorious over death. The first one to step out of the cave, but not the last. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we read this at funerals all the time, and that's great. But it's for the living. It's for us now to read. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55 through 57 says, Oh, death, where is your victory? I mean, this, this could be sung like a rap song, guys. It's boasting. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God. He gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Alpha Omega. He's the last sacrifice, the Lamb of God. He's the scapegoat. We're the guilty ones. We're the ones. But he takes the blame for us. He is victorious over all of death. He's the first one out of the cave, guys, but he's not the last one. And it would be massively rude of us today that our believers, to not include or provide the opportunity for those of you that are somewhat skeptical up to this point in time, to not join us in the celebration. And it's simple. It's nothing I say or do. It's your relationship with God. There's a time to publicly confess that. We call that water baptism. But this initial thing, this initial relationship of you and God, that's just what it is. It's you and God. So this morning, before we conclude this service and this time, I'm going to ask you, where do you stand with God? Are you still stuck in that cave looking at shadows on the wall and, and knowing there's something better? You know there's some, but you just, Christ wants that for you. Your creator wants that for you today. How does that happen? It's incredibly simple and massively life-changing. If you, like Wallace and Strobel and so many others, accept that the resurrection is real, then the implications for us are dynamic. What that means is that I am a sinner, that I am out of relationship with God. And there's nothing I can do, no amount of money I can give, no amount of actions I can do that will ever solve that. I'm always going to be guilty unless unless what's written in Scripture is real, unless Jesus was that lamb, unless he is the scapegoat with our sins placed upon him. And, and how do we access that? It says it's by faith. In other words, I, I this morning sit here and say, I believe. I believe that I'm a sinner. I believe that I need salvation. I believe God provided that through his own son and that crucifixion and that sacrifice there and the resurrection proves it. And so this morning, I repent of my sin and I accept you, Christ, as my sacrifice and as a result, as Thomas said, my Lord and my God. And so to that end, I'm going to ask if you just bow your head with me for just a few moments. No one's going to do anything strange. Close your eyes for just a moment. Give privacy. This is your moment with God. This is your moment with God. And if you have not made that commitment, that realization, but this morning, God's Holy Spirit's whispering to you. You feel strangely drawn, strangely stirred, you're in need of resurrection. You're in need of a new life. You're in need of this. Then this morning, you can simply pray. I'll do a prayer here, but you can put it in your own words or you can agree and copy mine. It goes like this. Father, God, God, I have sinned. I don't even realize in ways how I've done it, but other ones I really realize. In fact, some of them I realize so deeply, I don't see how you could possibly forgive me, God or accept me in any way. But your word says that you died 
for me, that you sacrificed yourself, that you became the scapegoat, that my sins were placed upon your head. And that if I believe this and that if I accept that you were crucified and sacrificed for me and my sins, as a free gift, I can accept your grace and be saved this day from my sins. I can, I can enter into your kingdom. I can begin the process of coming out of the cave and into the reality of your heaven and of your kingdom. And so, Lord, this morning, I repent. I am so sorry for all I've done. And this morning, I believe. I receive your gift of grace. I receive it. And I know my guilt now is gone. And I stand in your presence now. Teach me your ways, God. Teach me how to follow you, how to be your son or your daughter this day. I celebrate and I surrender myself to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you referenced anything close to that prayer, then you're now part of the family. Now, i got to warn you. In this family, there's a couple of weird uncles and really strange aunts. Okay? But most of the people are pretty good and just simple people that want to follow God. And you're welcome to join us as part of that. This Easter is meant to be celebrated. It's new life. It's resurrection. It's joy. It's the completeness of Christ's victory. And this morning, as family, we welcome you to join us in that celebration. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name Into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows Of my soul the work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy, what heart could is spoken I am forgiven the King of Kings calls me his own beautiful Savior I'm yours forever Jesus Christ my
Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on. Then came the morning. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. And out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. For Jesus, yours is the thoughts before we go. One is, um, Lilies have been a part of Easter for a long time. We've been blessed to have a whole bunch of them around here today. Um, there's a lot, a lot of stories behind them that when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane or even on the cross that wherever his blood dropped that lilies sprung up. And um, also their trumpet-like thing is supposed to announce the resurrection. Um, if you would like, I, I don't want to see these stay here in, in, for the next week or so just because I want them to be you. So if you want to, there's some up here and there's some in the atrium. Take some with you. And especially if, if God spoke to you in this service particularly. But either way, take these with you. All right? But here's the final thing. We've had a tradition for a long time. We're going to fulfill it here today one more time. I say, He is risen. And you say, He is risen indeed. Okay? Please notice the tense. It's not He was. He is and He still is. Risen, okay? Jesus is alive, okay? So I'm going to say, and we're going to do it three times. I'm going to say, He is risen. You're going to say, He is risen indeed. Right, we're going to say this three times. And the first time, we're going to be pretty chill, all right? Like, hey, so He's risen, all right? Second time, it's going to kind of hit us like, wait a minute, this is kind of serious. We're going to go a little louder, okay, a little more intense. And then third time, I would like some people who are right now golfing over on Rambler to be disturbed. <laughs> On their story, just, whoa, what was that? Okay, all right, so ready. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen Father, I pray that we would live this out in this next year of time. I pray that anyone who walked in with a burden today will feel their heart lifted. <clears throat> For those that have faced death or in the shadow of death, in that valley, Lord, that they'd be encouraged, and especially for those who've reached out to you for the first time. So, Father, we walk this out in freedom before you, ready to gather again next week at 9-11, Lord God, to honor you. But right now, we walk in freedom and celebration. We give grace and we give thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the church said, amen. 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 Happy Easter, folks.
revival. I'll put it on. 